Well, good morning and welcome back to Adult Sunday School here with Holy Cross Lutheran Church. We are continuing in our study of the book of Acts as we follow the followers of Jesus in what they get up to after Jesus ascends into heaven. We're on chapter 18 this week, moving right along through the book of Acts. And in chapter 17 last week, we followed Paul as he got into a little bit of trouble in northern Greece and then ended up in Athens. And while he was in Athens, he tried to interact with these very Greek scholars and tell them about who Jesus is and who the God that he represents is all about. And it doesn't go well. I mean, it doesn't go bad. It just doesn't go good. It just kind of is. But it gives us an example of both the patience that we need when we try to share our experiences of Christ with people that don't have a background in it, and also reminds us of the importance of not just sticking to Christianese when we interact with people, but instead trying to explain things of God in ways that they will understand. And now this week, we pick up when Paul is basically done in Athens, and he starts to move on to, well, the next adventure that he goes on. So uh, chapter 18, starting with verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus. He had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul visited with them. Because they practiced the same trade, he stayed and worked with them. They all worked with leather. So this is, well, this is when we meet two of my favorite characters in the Bible, but we'll get there in a second. Um, let's talk about Corinth for a bit. So Corinth is the capital of the region of Achaia, which is the Roman province that encompasses most of Greece and some of the outlying islands. Um, this province gets a little bit confusing because there's also a region called Achaia, um, but also sometimes all of Greece is called Achaia. Um, the province, well, you'll see it on the map in the, this way, maybe that way. I don't actually remember where I put these, um, but you'll see it in the map. The kind of the region that encompasses Achaia is basically Greece and Corinth is the capital of Achaia. This is a port city that had been conquered by the Romans uh, about a hundred or so years before um, before the events in Acts 18, maybe 150 or so years. Um, but this city had been conquered and the Romans made it their capital of this province of Achaia. So Corinth is kind of a big deal. It's a pretty populous city. There's a lot of trade that goes through Corinth and a lot of people live there. And some of the people that live there are Aquila and his wife, Priscilla. Now, this is interesting because this is the only time in the rest of the Bible that Aquila gets named first. Every other time, Priscilla comes first. And these folk were Jews who had lived in Rome, but were kicked out by an edict of Emperor Claudius either in AD 41 or AD 49, that um, kicked all the Jews out of Rome. Now, we don't know for sure when this edict was. Uh, like I said, it's either in 41 or 49. In my reading, 49 seems a bit more likely, given what we know about um, kind of some other things that are going to happen in a couple verses. Um, and it says that they arrived in Italy recently, or sorry, arrived in Greece recently. Now, Priscilla and Aquila, they show up both here in chapter 18. They're important here at the beginning, and then they show up at the end. They also appear in lists of greetings that Paul writes um, in Romans 16, 1 Corinthians 16, and 2 Timothy 4. Um, these Priscilla and Aquila are always mentioned as being good friends of Paul and important in the church. And one of the fascinating things about them is they're always named together and they're 
always listed with Priscilla or sometimes Prissa, which is the more formal version of her name, comes first. Now, that's weird. And that tells us a lot about Priscilla because even today, generally, if you introduce um, spouses, if it's a, you know, you generally introduce husband first, then the wife. Now, there are exceptions. Um, for instance, um, in my, um, among my in-laws, my wife always is listed first. It's always Michelle and Mike, never Mike and Michelle. And I think there's a sense that, you know, kind of as we, as we meet people, we put things together as who we knew first. Um, and aside from this very first mention of Aquila and Priscilla, Priscilla always is listed first. And that tells us something about who she is in the early church. And it kind of almost gives you an idea that Priscilla might even be more important in the early church than Aquila is. And the, uh, that I'll, I'll talk about this more kind of as we get a little bit later um, when uh, Aquila and Priscilla meet Apollos. But aside from this first time in Acts chapter 2, Priscilla and Aquila are always listed as Priscilla and Aquila. Um, we also find out here that Paul works with leather. Uh, a lot of times we hear him mentioned as he's a tent maker. Um, so he makes tents, shoes. He's a, he's a leather worker. Um, anything that you need leather made into, Paul's your guy. And so are Priscilla and Aquila. They're all also leather workers. So what else does Paul get up to? Every Sabbath, he interacted with the people in the synagogue, trying to convince both Jews and Greeks. Once Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself fully to the word, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. So this is normal for Paul. Uh, we get this aside that Silas and Timothy showed up from, um, remember Paul had left them up in Macedonia when they were experiencing some trouble in um, Thessalonica, I think. Um, Paul went to Berea and then went down to um, Athens, or was it in Berea? I, I can't remember now. But they got in, they were experiencing some hostility in Macedonia. So Silas and Timothy, Timothy stayed down there. Now they've rejoined Paul in Corinth, uh, and they all started preaching the word, as they did. They would go into the synagogues. They do this everywhere. Go into the synagogue, start talking about Jesus, and some people listen and some people don't. In this case, it's really a mixed bag, but we also see some one of the most hilariously petty acts that I've seen in Scripture, and I love it. I think it's just great. Um, so verse 6, When they opposed and slandered him, he shook the dust from his clothes in protest and said to them, You are responsible for your own fates. I am innocent. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. So he left the synagogue and went next door to the home of Titius Justice, a Gentile God worshiper. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household came to believe in the Lord. Many Corinthians believed and were baptized after listening to Paul. So this is this is just fantastic, right? So he's he's in the synagogue, and some people are listening, including Crispus, the synagogue leader, but some other folk are putting up a fight. So Paul says. All right, you do your thing. I'm going to preach to Gentiles. And he walks out the door, turns left, takes another left, and immediately goes into the house of Titius Justice next door. Like, you caught that part, right? He went literally next door to the synagogue and continued to preach in the home of this Gentile God worshiper. This person who knew who God was but wasn't fully part of the Jewish community. That is so hilariously and majestically petty that I love it. It's the kind of thing that I'm really in for. And oh man, can you just imagine the people that were hostile to Paul as he walks out the door and goes next door? Um, it's like if the, you know, it's like when you see churches uh, or towns that have like a first Lutheran church and a second Lutheran church and they're right next door to each other. I don't know if that ever actually happens, but it's that level of hilariously petty uh, that is just great. 
Um, and it's a neat little thing that Luke gives us this information that he went next door <laughs> to, to set up his shop where he's going to be preaching from now on. Um, so uh, moving on, verse nine. One night, the Lord said to Paul in a vision, don't be afraid, continue speaking, don't be silent. I'm with you and no one who attacks you will harm you for I have many people in this city. So he stayed there 18 months teaching God's word among them. This is the longest that Paul spends in one place, um, really until he's under house arrest in Rome. Um, to sp he spends a year and a half there in Corinth just teaching the gospel, telling people about Jesus, and growing the church there. Um, this becomes a pretty big center of Christianity. And, I mean, it's got two letters named after it. Uh, but so in Corinth there, Paul's just hanging out. He's got Silas and Timothy there. He's got Priscilla and Aquila there. And they're just all together preaching the gospel and growing God's church in Corinth. But things don't stay rosy the whole time. Uh, with verse 12. Now, when Gallio was the governor of the province of Achaia, the Jews united in their opposition against Paul and brought him before the court. This man is persuading others to worship God unlawfully, they declared. So this isn't the first time that Paul's opposition has tried this trick. Uh, they really like showing up in front of Roman governors and saying, hey, this Paul guy, he's saying stuff he shouldn't be saying. You need to do something about it. Um, but this doesn't go as well as it usually does for Paul's opposition. Now, about Gallio, we do have a lot of records on Gallio. Uh, his full name is Lucius Junius Gallio uh, Aeneanus. He is the son of a popular Roman writer named Seneca the Elder. Uh, and his brother is an even more popular Roman writer named Seneca the Younger. So he's not really as big of a deal as either of them are, but he's peripherally associated with these two people who are pretty big deals in the Roman world. And he served as council of uh, this region between 51 and 52 um, AD, which is why I think that the 49 AD date for Claudius Edict evicting the Jews from Rome seems to fit a bit better because from 49 to 51, add in some extra time for travel, and that's about 18 months that Paul is there in Corinth before they really get fancy. So Paul is there. He's in front of uh, Gallio. He's being accused of persuading others to worship God unlawfully. So what happens next? Verse 14. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, if there had been some injury or criminal behavior, I would have reason to accept your complaint. However, since these, squab these are squabbles about a message, names, and your own law, deal with them yourselves. I have no desire to sit in judgment over such things. That's one way to deal with the problem. Gallio doesn't seem to care about this very Jewish sort of conflict. From all Gallio can tell is one group of Jews are upset that another group of Jews is teaching something different and Gallio just doesn't care. But then something really weird happens. Uh, verse 16, he expelled them from the court, but everyone seized Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and gave him a beating in the presence of the governor. And none of this mattered to Gallio. I don't understand, and most translators appear to not understand, why in the world this synagogue leader named Sosthenes got beat up. Um, some people think that it's the Greeks who beat up Sosthenes for wasting the governor's time bringing this stupid charge against Paul. But some other folk think that the Jews beat up Sosthenes because he followed Paul like Crispus did, the other synagogue leader. Or maybe just everybody was bored and they wanted to beat somebody up and Sosthenes was there. It's really not clear. It's, an, it's a really weird and yet also incredibly vague detail that Luke gives us here. 
why in the world did Sosthenes get beat up? It doesn't make any sense. And then, but that's, but that's the end. That's all we get. That's, we don't get much more information than that. That this guy named Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, got beat up in the presence of the governor and Gallio didn't care. All right, so moving on to verse 18. After Paul stayed in Corinth for some time, he said goodbye to the brothers and sisters. At the Corinthian seaport of Cancrea, he had his head shaved since he had made a solemn promise. Then, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila, he sailed away to Syria. We don't really know what this vow is that Paul is um, making here, but we know that he's, Leaving Corinth now, heads down to this, um, the port city nearby uh, called Cancrea, um, and he takes this vow, but we don't know what his vow is. We don't know if he is shaving his head in preparation for taking a vow. We don't know if he, like, got himself a haircut after a time where he had taken a vow. But this head shaving thing, when you take a vow, is actually fairly common. Like when, you, um, if you've made a promise to the Lord, you don't cut your hair. So it might have something to do with him staying in Corinth for eighteen months. Um, it's just not very clear what his vow is, but it was obviously important enough. Um, these are the same kind of vows, um, like uh, Samson, where he was set apart as a vow to the Lord and he didn't cut his hair. Uh, and of course, when he finally did get his hair cut, um, it went really badly for him. Um, but that's probably not going to go. Uh, well, it doesn't go too badly for Paul. There's nothing wonky about this. Either he's getting ready to take a vow or he had just taken a vow. Uh, and either way, he's getting a haircut because either sometime before or sometime after this, he's not going to get another haircut for a while. Um, so then he, Priscilla and Aquila, they sail away to Syria. Um, and then in verse 19, after they arrived in Ephesus, he left Priscilla and Aquila and entered the synagogue and interacted with the Jews. They asked him to stay longer, but he declined. As he said farewell to them, though, he added, God willing, I will return. Then he sailed off from Ephesus. He arrived in Caesarea, went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church, and then went down to Antioch. And after some time there, he left and traveled from place to place in the region of Galatia and the district of Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So Paul gets to Corinth, or he leaves Corinth, gets to Syria, ends up in Ephesus, leaves Priscilla and Aquila there, and then he kind of goes on a weird walkabout goes to Ephesus, to Caesarea, up to Jerusalem, down to Antioch again. And then he kind of went up into um, the hill country, up into Galatia and Phrygia, and just was visiting all those churches that he had been to before. Um, Ephesus kind of becomes Paul's home base after this point. Um, and during the time when he is in Ephesus, this is when he writes the letters to the Corinthian churches. Um I also should mention um, that the church in Cancrea, that port city near Corinth, um, they eventually have a deacon named Phoebe who delivers the letter to the Romans to the church in Rome. So she's important enough to get both get a mention in Romans 16 and also be entrusted with this letter that Paul is sending to the Roman church. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, uh, verse 24, Meanwhile, a certain Jew named Apollos arrived in Ephesus. He was a native of Alexandria and was well-educated and effective in his use of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and spoke as one stirred up by the Spirit. He taught accurately the things about Jesus, even though he was aware only of the baptism John proclaimed and practiced. So this Apollos guy, he is from Alexandria in Egypt, and he knows about Jesus, but apparently doesn't know about the Holy Spirit. So he's about two thirds of the way there. Uh, it seems pretty obvious that he has the Holy Spirit. I mean, it says he speaks as one who is stirred up by the Spirit, but he doesn't quite know everything that he needs to know yet. Um, he has enthusiasm, but lacks knowledge. And he's been preaching all around Ephesus. Uh, verse 26, he, became, he began speaking with confidence in the synagogue. 
When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they received him into their circle of friends and explained to him God's way more accurately. So here we get uh, Priscilla and Aquila, they pull, kind of pull Apollos aside and teach him the rest of what he doesn't know, which I imagine is something about the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. Because he knows about Jesus, he just doesn't seem to know about the Holy Spirit. But there's a problem that this incident brings up if you know what first what instruction Paul gives in 1 Timothy 2, verse 11 and 12 which is a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Now, a lot of Christians around the world have read that verse and said, oh, well, then woman, women can't teach men. But right here in Acts, a woman just corrected a man. Priscilla, along with Aquila, corrected Apollos. So if she's not supposed to teach a man, how does that work? But then we get a bunch of other examples. I mean, Phoebe was a deacon, so that means she had some authority in the church. Uh, there's a woman named Junia mentioned in Romans chapter 16 who is outstanding among the apostles. There's at least six other women in that same chapter who are commended by Paul as being great servants of the church. And the best resolution to this conundrum that really solves all the problems is that 1 Timothy 2 is probably about a specific situation that they were facing in the church in Ephesus at the time that we don't know the context of, but it's meant to be a resolution to a specific problem in that specific place and not something meant as a general instruction for everyone everywhere. Especially because this idea of women being important in the early church is pretty obvious. I mean, look at the role of women in Jesus's ministry, the number of women that supported him and took part in the things that he was doing. Look at Priscilla consistently being named first and even held up as a candidate for the writer of the book of Hebrews. Um, you see all of these examples of very prominent women who are teaching and preaching and doing the work of the kingdom of God that seems to counteract what Paul says later in 1 Timothy, unless what Paul says in 1 Timothy is very specific to that particular context that they were facing. Because the rest of the things we see seem to show that women have very prominent roles, both teaching and having authority over men. And of course, our own tradition uh, has well, LCMC, since its, in, since its inception, has encouraged women to be pastors. Um, si similarly, um, our organization before has had uh, women pastors, I think since the 70s. Um, so while this is relatively new, it's also relatively common for us to just accept that, yep, this that's just fine. And it seems to, to have been very common in the early church, and then it's something that fell out of favor later as, well, as time went on and the church got to be a bit more organized, uh, basically the men started to try pushing the women out of those positions of authority um, because that's unfortunately how things go sometimes. But back to what's happening with Apollos. So verse 27 when he wanted to travel to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples so they would open their homes to him. Once he arrived, he was of great help to those who had come to believe through grace. He would vigorously defeat Jewish arguments in public debate using the scriptures to prove that Jesus was the Christ. So this is an interesting flip that happens where Apollos went to where Paul just was. Paul had left Corinth and went to Ephesus ish and Apollos is going to leave Ephesus and go to Corinth. So while Paul is kind of up around Turkey, um, around Ephesus and then the region of Galatia, um, Apollos went to Corinth to continue the work of the kingdom of God there. And next week we'll find out what Paul was doing 
in Turkey while all of this was happening. Um, so that's it for this week's Sunday School. Uh, hopefully we'll see you next week as we continue in our journey through Acts. If you have any questions, uh, ask them in the comments. If you have anything to add to the discussion, add that down there as well. And until next week, God bless and have a wonderful time.